Welcome to Mind of a Scientist. I'm delighted to introduce Sonoma Water, Environmental Specialist, Ann Creelock. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be invited and to um, get to speak with you all today. I'm a senior environmental specialist with Sonoma Water. I've been there for a number of years, um, but I'd love to talk a little bit about kind of my uh, journey, my career path, and, um, and then I'd love to share a few slides with you to talk about uh, what I do now and um, some of the skills that I need for, for my current position. Um, so I uh, grew up in Southern California. I grew up um, not in uh, wildland areas. I grew up in the suburbs. Um, I went to the mall. Um, I wasn't a big backpacker and adventurer, um, but I had the ocean there uh, nearby and I found a lot of inspiration um, going to the ocean and witnessing um, porpoises and, and wildlife there. And um, I think that that was a really big um, part of what inspired me to go into the sciences and the biological sciences. Um, additionally, I loved to watch documentaries about science and, and nature. Um, and I had a couple of parents who, uh, while they weren't big outdoorsy people at the time, um, had spent a lot of time sailing across oceans on small boats and, and having really big adventures. Uh, so I listened to their stories and they were really inspirational to me. Um, so when I was in school, um, say like starting in middle school, I was really looking for opportunities for adventure myself. Um, and um, so when things came up through school programs, I really took advantage of those opportunities. So for example, in middle school, there was a Washington DC trip and I was able to go on that. And that was my first time really away from my family. And then in high school, um, I took advantage of a program through a local junior college. It was a student ambassador program. And um, basically a whole bunch of us high school students were able to study various foreign countries. And um, then at the end of this period of time, and it was, it was a lot of work actually, um, we were able to travel to those countries. So as a 15 year old, I went to the Soviet Union and Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and England. We had a couple of homestays. Um, I lived on a farm in England for a week. I lived with a family in Stockholm, Sweden for a week and, um, you know, ate, was served tongue in Moscow. Um, it was a really huge adventure. Um, and then a couple of years later, I did that again uh, in, in a different location. I spent a summer living um, and going to school in Mexico. So I had a host family and all we did was speak Spanish and um, learned about history and art and culture in Mexico. And um, so all of those opportunities, um, it, was, it was a lot of work to get there. I uh, saved up my money and worked uh, when I could and my parents chipped in and was able to, to um, take advantage of those when they came up. So I guess one piece of advice I would definitely have is now is the time to take advantage of those opportunities. Get out of your comfort zone. Um, get out of the comfort and safety of your own community and your own household and go see the world when things come up. Um, so that theme kind of carried me into college as well. When I went to college, um, I knew generally that I wanted to study biological sciences, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with that yet. So I kind of kept my options open for a while. Um, but when things came up, I jumped on them. Um, so I spent a summer um, doing, um, studying birds in Costa Rica um, for one professor and his graduate students. And then um, that fall, I spent um, a couple months working and living in Nepal. So um, had so many adventures. Um, as part of those trips. And again, you know, you have to seek out those opportunities. And in college, especially at a large university, you really need to seek out your professors and meet them and get to know them and meet the grad students. And just um, opportunities will come up if you start networking in that way. 
Um, so those were huge formative experiences working way outside your comfort zone. I mean, I got chased by a rhinoceros at one point. Um, you know, there, there are all sorts of great adventures uh, that await you. If you can um, network, meet people, find those opportunities and really run with it. And sometimes you'll get paid a stipend or they'll pay your airfare, et cetera. It's hard work, but um, definitely well worth it. Um, so in, um, oh, also, you know, any other opportunities to volunteer in college. So I volunteered in an emergency room for a couple of years because I wasn't really sure if I wanted to try medicine or go into the environmental sciences. I was kind of split. And, you know, any and all internships and opportunities, they help you figure out what you like and what you don't like. And finding out what you don't like is just as important as finding out what you like. Um, so I ended up deciding not to go into medicine, but uh, go into uh, environmental sciences instead. So um, then I wanted to get a graduate degree. Um, I spoke to a lot of people about, um, you know, what, what was the best pathway to actually work in the field? And I wasn't sure that a PhD was right for me to, to work in the field rather than, um, I didn't necessarily want to be a professor. Um, so I got a master's degree. I went to a state school for that and um, really wanted to learn, learn skills that would be good in professions in this, in this field, uh, really practical skills. So, um, um, so in graduate school, you know, while the undergraduate was really about getting a bachelor's, it was really about kind of expanding horizons and uh, experimenting and learning new um, potential jobs and fields out there, graduate school was about focusing and figuring out a topic and running with it and finishing it. So a lot of folks uh, in graduate school were um, they kind of hemmed and hawed and changed their mind a few times about what their master's thesis would be, et cetera. And a lot of those folks didn't end up finishing. Um, it's really key to pick something and go with it and finish it. So now nobody really cares what my master's was about, um, but they care that I have one. So, um, you know, even though two thirds of the way through your master's project, you might be pretty bored with it, just finish it. So that is one piece of advice that I would definitely share with all of you. Um, so then after graduate school, um, I had a couple of different jobs that um, were in my chosen field, give or take. And um, they both, they all really helped, you know, me learn different aspects of this field. So, um, um, and then I started working for Sonoma Water. For the last several years, I've been a senior environmental specialist with Sonoma Water. And most of you are probably familiar with Sonoma Water, but I'll give a 30 second overview. Um, Sonoma Water that generally provides drinking water to cities and water districts around the area. So Sonoma County and also Northern Marin County and other portions of Marin County as well. Um, so working a lot with the Russian River and a little bit with groundwater. Um, we're not the ones that folks write their water bill checks to. Uh, that would be cities and, and smaller districts. Um, flood management, uh, managing creeks and other um, infrastructure to make sure that downtown Santa Rosa doesn't flood, for example. Um, and then sanitation and wastewater, that was something that we took over a little later for a lot of areas, not everywhere. Um, and then a newer role for us is really thinking about climate change. And what, how can we reduce our own impacts on climate change, but also how do we adapt to this changing climate? So um, because, you know, step one, when you're thinking about climate change is to try to reduce your own climate um, footprint, your own carbon emissions. We worked on this um, starting in 2006, really reducing our emissions related to, at least related to um, electricity use um, and we're working on it kind of system-wide. Um, so we started incorporating a photovoltaic, that's the PV, so solar panels. So installing solar panels at different facilities, um, rethinking where we get our electricity and um, using Sonoma Clean Power um, accounts. 
uh, to source our electricity and um, helping actually form Sonoma Clean Power and um, other entities to help Sonoma County reduce its carbon footprint. Um, a lot of the folks working on this directly are engineers. And, um, and then when projects come up where construction is needed, somebody in my department in the environmental department would help make sure that those projects are as environmentally friendly as possible. So even projects that are for the environment could have environmental impacts. And so you need to figure that out and make sure you're, you're doing a good job there. Um, one of my roles is to think through uh, climate adaptation. So by this, I mean, we're, we've got changing temperatures. We know there's sea level rise. We've already had around eight inches of sea level rise in the last century. We know there are gonna be changes in precipitation patterns. So um, uh, peak precipitation, so extreme precip precipitation is going to get uh, more extreme. Um, we're gonna have more droughts. We're gonna have more wildfire. We're gonna have more flooding on our rivers and streams. Um, so given that um, all of this is, is presents a huge challenge in terms of, you know, for a water agency figuring out how to continue supplying clean, fresh drinking water um, and keeping everybody safe in terms of flooding and, and all of that, um, what do we do? So we're working on a climate adaptation plan now with um, a whole bunch of different strategies to address each of those issues listed on this slide. So that's, that's in progress right now. Um, so that's the first bullet here, the climate adaptation plan. Um, and then in terms of droughts and floods and water supply, one of the things we need to do is understand what's called atmospheric rivers better. And those, you can think of them as like Mississippi River flowing in, across the sky, across the Pacific Ocean and dumping rain somewhere on the West Coast. Um, so using science to better understand those and then using that science to change how you operate. In terms of the fire, so, and I'll, I'll address that a little bit more in the next couple slides. And then fire, um, how do we adapt to more fire? How do we make our ecosystems healthier and our communities safer? Um, and then this last bullet, we'll work with lots of partners to make things happen. No one agency or entity can do all of this. We all have to um, work across jurisdictional boundaries and agency boundaries to make these things happen. So just a quick um, from NOAA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, a quick view of what an atmospheric river is, um, moving tons and tons of water across the Pacific Ocean towards the West Coast where it dumps a lot of rain. We get um, a lot of our flooding um, from atmospheric rivers and a lot of our water supply ultimately from atmospheric rivers. I have notices making noises on my laptop. Um, so speaking of partners, working with tons of partners to install better radar in our area so that we can detect atmospheric rivers uh, with more precision and know how much rain is actually coming. So our... Um, Radar system in this area is really aimed for the type of storm that would hit the Midwest. Um, it was designed to hit um, to, to focus in on a certain um, elevation in the sky, and that's not where atmospheric rivers come in. Atmospheric rivers come in lower. So uh, we're working with a ton of partners and got some funding to expand our understanding, to expand our radar system so we can study them and know in advance how much rain is coming. So here's an image of an atmospheric river coming across to um, North America and an image of Lake Mendocino, pretty dry. Um, so the idea is to use the science to better manage our uh, reservoirs. Uh, so we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers to use the science to update their models to um, better manage uh, currently Lake Mendocino and then hopefully expand that to other um, reservoirs. And so if you see a big storm coming and then it peters out and there's really uh, not much rain uh, that will actually arrive, you don't have to dump a whole bunch of water from your reservoir to make room for the coming rainstorm. So we can preserve that water behind the dam and um, better manage these, these resources. So this is kind of a groundbreaking um, 
uh, study and modeling effort and, and coordination exercise. Uh, my role in this was to help with the uh, environmental analysis to support this project and, and make, it, make it happen. So in terms of fire, um, I'll spend the remaining time talking about fire. Um, so uh, several years ago, we started um, thinking and planning for large scale fire and its potential impacts to water, water supply, uh, water quality, and the watersheds that feed um, our rivers and lakes. Lake Sonoma is our primary uh, drinking water source in this region. And the watershed that surrounds it is somewhere around 83,000 acres, give or take. Some of it's in Sonoma County and some of it is in Mendocino County. And we own very, very little of it. So Sonoma Water only owns the parcel in red here within that black watershed boundary. And that um, blue uh, kind of squiggle, that's the lake. Um, so we are not managing these lands that feed the reservoir. So it became very clear to us, even before the 2017 fires, that we needed to start planning for wildfires in this watershed and start um, meeting our neighbors. Um, a lot of private landowners, um, uh, in addition to the Army Corps who uh, manages the lands around the lake, and think through what are we going to do? We have a lot of needs in common. Um, you guys don't want your homes burned down, and we don't want the watershed to burn um, at high severity. So what can we do together? So we started looking for funding and formed, um, found a little funding. Um, not a lot of people were interested in this topic until after the 2017 fires. And then we were able to get some funding and um, put together a, a really great group of, of agencies. So again, this is about thinking outside the box. This is about working with different partners that you normally wouldn't be working with. So um, usually Sonoma Water wouldn't be working with a fire district um, until you're you know, spraying water on a, on a fire. Um, so this was really, um, of a groundbreaking thing, um, moving across across jurisdictional boundaries and across agencies to think um, strategically. So uh, we hosted a series of workshops in the Lake Sonoma watershed, and we invited all the experts um, from forestry to fire to grazing experts and all the landowners. Um, and we got a, a really good showing. We held a series of workshops uh, that included uh, site visits and presentations and a lot of discussions about potential solutions. So some of the obvious um, work that needs to get done for fire resiliency includes uh, home hardening and defensible space. These are terms that you're going to hear a lot in the in this kind of world. So how do you make it so your home doesn't burn as easily and your landscape um, than 100 feet of your home doesn't burn so easily. So we had experts talk about that. And then we had forestry experts come and talk about how to manage our forests so that they're uh, more healthy, but um, also don't burn as readily. So for example, our forests um, that have not seen fire are really crowded. Um, it's really counterintuitive for those of us who grew up seeing very crowded forests and thinking that was normal. Um, but a lot of these forests are very crowded. There are a lot of um, what people might say stems per acre. So um, you might have way more trees per acre than you would have um, in previous centuries. So the trees that are there are less healthy. Um, they're stressed for water and nutrients and um, they burn more readily. And once you do a little bit of thinning, pull out the ones that are, are smaller, um, you end up sequestering more carbon and having healthier, more resilient trees. Um, grazing is a big one. Uh, sheeps, cows, goats uh, can help reduce the, um, the vegetation on the ground and the ladder fuel that brings surface fire up into the canopies, into the crowns of trees and can make a, a um, fire a lot more severe. Um, and prescribed burns. Um, prescribed burns are a way of bringing um, food fire back to the land. Um, we, a lot of our ecosystems evolved with fire. Some of them depend on fire to thrive. And um, for example, we have oak woodlands that are getting inundated and, and 
um, dominated by Douglas fir trees that tend to invade an oak woodland and take over. Um, Native Americans uh, used fire to manage landscapes here for thousands of years until um, Europeans came in and, and stopped them from doing that. And we're kind of seeing that effect of that um, of not having enough fire on the landscape and all this um, vegetation building up. It's getting very crowded and um, it's, um, it's a lot of fuel. So a firefighter would, would say there's a lot of fuel on the landscape. Um, so if we do prescribed burns, then we have uh, the opportunity to bring good fire that restores a landscape uh, onto the land and reduce the risk of a very high severity or much more dangerous catastrophic fire. So if I can take just one moment, oh, and this is, this is my one and only selfie in this um, presentation. Uh, this was at a controlled burn in the Lake Sonoma watershed. Um, so I will stop sharing and then I'll start sharing again. See if I can show you a one minute video. Um, are you able to see this? Okay, hopefully this will work. Let me know if it doesn't. Just a one minute video. I don't think there are any, um, there's music, but no words. Can you hear it? So I'll go back to sharing my PowerPoint and then I'll finish up because I know we're at, at time. Um, so as part of my work, I met a lot of people who were uh, firefighters, who were prescribed burn um, practitioners and, and others. And um, it just kind of looked like fun. So I decided to go ahead and become a wildland firefighter on the side. So I volunteer for this organization, Audubon Canyon Ranch, and um, they're um, they're great at advocating for um, prescribed fire and bringing good fire back to the land. Um, and they've been great partners uh, in the work in Lake Sonoma. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like for Doug Fir to take over an oak woodland, you've got them establishing on the upper right and on the lower or upper left and on the lower right, they've taken over the oak woodland and the oak trees are dying and no longer producing acorns. A couple other photos. This is a before and after of a prescribed burn that I was part of um, in the Lake Sonoma watershed. So you can see the trees are fully intact and happy. And um, the grasses and some of the underbrush and the young Doug firs are gone or will be. Um, so continuing this work, thinking outside the box, um, working with non-traditional partners, using science and data um, also, I think uh, Christine is going to talk about fire recovery a little bit. Um, I worked on the watershed task force um, to recover from the wild bridge and glass fires and think about how to protect um, creeks and endangered salmon from the runoff from those fires. Um, and then just this is my last or second to last slide. Um, so some of the tasks required and some of the skills needed for my position, um, writing um, good 
uh, grammar and sentence structure, being able to organize your thoughts and convey them uh, succinctly, um, analysis and problem solving. So find a specialty and really um, do your homework and keep up on it. Um, get organized, ask questions and find peace with multitasking, a lot of that. Uh, meetings, you need good co communication skills, um, have a good clear purpose for your meeting, um, write an agenda, share the spotlight, field work, be able to work in rough conditions. Um, and in terms of leadership, think outside the box. We need big ideas, um, but also be patient because change is very slow. Um, seek input from people you disagree with and from those who come before you. Uh, you don't have to have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers, but make sure to um, know when you don't know and ask questions and work with colleagues to, to brainstorm and think of solutions because you're going to find better solutions if you work as a team. And then last, I would just say, um, uh, prop up those around you, be generous with your compliments and um, your own accomplishments will speak for themselves. And then uh, last things, recommended reading. Um, the bad news bears of this is really the <laughs> Bay Area uh, sub-regional report of the fourth climate assessment for the state. Um, it has a lot of good data and modeling for climate change in our region, in our part of California. And then to counteract um, that depressing report, I would go to a field guide for climate anxiety for a little self-care. And that's, uh, that's it. Wow, thank you so much, Anne. Your work is so fascinating and impactful. And um, so now students, please make sure that you put at least one question in the chat. And while you're doing that, um, could you tell us about a mentor that you've had? Hmm, so many. Um, uh, I, I've had a lot of mentors. Um, you know, my manager at Sonoma Water is a very steady rock. Um, she does her homework and knows um, exactly, um, she anticipates what questions will be asked and has those answers before they've been asked. Um, she's steady under fire, never gets her feathers ruffled. I greatly admire that. I would also say the um, manager of the Fire Forward program who um, helped me learn um, and train to be a, a wildland firefighter on the side. She um, is super humble, um, is very knowledgeable, does her homework, always um, keeps up on her specialty and props up everyone else um, other than herself. So those are some of the, some of the, um, I don't know, values and, and styles that have really been, they've meant a lot to me. Stefan asks, can you tell us in detail what you worked on during the fires and how intense and stressful was the situation? Um, so I'm assuming uh, fire recovery during the wall bridge and glass fires, maybe. Um, those were uh, one of our biggest tasks was um, to assess the damage and work with the state and state geologists to figure out um, how bad the damage was, um, how badly burned the soils were, for example. Um, when soils are superheated, they become hydrophobic and they repel water. So if you have a steep hillside with hydrophobic soils on top, when it rains the next winter, that runoff can be a real problem. It can cause landslides and um, debris flows to enter waterways um, like the Russian River, like um, Mark West Creek, places with endangered fish, like uh, Lake Sonoma, places that are really key in terms of water supply. So trying to protect those resources was um, kind of the biggest uh, challenge and concern for, for me and my work. In addition, um, those debris flows and, and landslides can be a real risk for homeowners and anybody trying to get back on their land. So trying to make sure that we had an alert system and signage to protect anybody within the burn zone from the, um, uh, from the rains the following winter. Mm -hmm. Aliyah asks, how do the radars work? What information do they use to give you answers on probable rainfall? Um, I am not a total expert on this, but I will give you a quick answer. And that is um, they do a better job 
of detecting how much moisture is in those, um, those storms, those clouds coming over the Pacific Ocean. So some, um, some radar systems are, um, are very localized and then others need to be built on the top of a mountain so you can see miles and miles further out to see. And that gives you um, short-term kind of precision and long-term forecasting ability. So um, that is one of the things we really lack is that long-term forecasting ability. We are, our understanding of how much precipitation is in those clouds is really pretty sparse when they're um, way out to sea. Mm -hmm. Carrie is wondering, why does Sonoma County not have fluoride in its water? What are the pros and cons of this decision? Mm. Um, I am definitely not part of this decision-making um, process. Um, I do, so I guess I would have to defer that to someone like Pam Jean at Sonoma Water. Um, she's head of operations. And um, we've had plenty of conversations about fluoride and um, whether or not it's really required and whether or not it makes sense, um, you know, moving forward, how to, how to manage that. So I don't have a good answer to that, but Pam Jean at Sonoma Water could definitely help with that answer. Mm -hmm. um, Kaylee is wondering, getting into this line of work, what was the hardest part for you? Um, for me, I think the, um, I guess I would say two things. One was kind of an assumption going into it in my early years that um, there were people out there with all the answers, that um, somebody knew how to deal with this, you know, whatever it was um, at the time. And, um, and that if I just kept studying and studying and studying, I, maybe I would find the answer too. And with climate change and all of these things that are so new and we're all just kind of learning as we go, I'm finding that nobody really has the answers and we're all just doing our best to figure it out given our own expertise. So that was an interesting kind of um, shift that needed to happen. Um, and then um, also, I think the other piece to that would be just trying to decide which path to take, because it feels like such a momentous decision when you're in college, when you're in high school, when you're in grad school, figuring out what path to take because uh, specializes also means closing the doors on other um, options. So um, it's all a big decision, but whatever you do, um, you know, you'll, it will end up being a really good path for you. You can make it a really good path for you. Cameron is wondering, how do you stay calm when you need to, when doing your job? Um, well, one, um, I learned how to meditate, um, two, exercise, and three, um, making sure you're surrounded by other people who know what they're doing. Um, again, you don't have to have all the answers, but you need to uh, know when to ask when you don't know. And um, so, for example, in the prescribed fire world, um, you know, in the very beginning, being around people who, well, still now, being around people who you trust and who have uh, experience. Um, it takes a while, you know, some people talk about your 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. It takes a while to become an expert in something, um, in any particular topic. So just make sure you're in con contact with people who can help you um, think through problems. Um, in terms of fires and fire recovery, it can be, um, challenging. Um, it's stressful work and thinking about climate change is stressful work. I don't watch a lot of documentaries on climate change right now um, because I, I live and breathe it every day at work. So um, I escape through audiobooks and, and other ways, hiking and, and things. Hmm. Mateo asks, during a controlled burn, is there a lot of stress or is it less so because you know what's going on? With every controlled burn, you have a plan. So it has been, um, you know, there are controlled burns that ranchers might do on their own property um, with just kind of minimal planning, but with the types of prescribed burns that, um, that we do, and I'm, uh, I should stress, I'm a volunteer 
there are other people in charge of the burn, um, so I can't take credit for their work. But um, there's somebody called the Burn Boss. Uh, they've gone through months of planning um, permits through various agencies, so air districts and CAL FIRE often. Um, and um, there's a plan, there's a set of criteria that need to be met in the morning. So if your temperature, humidity, fuel moisture does not meet that prescription, then you don't do the burn. So for example, I was gonna do a burn yesterday, but the um, conditions were not right for it. So we called it off and you know all of us went home. So um, planning, 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 having a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D and knowing exactly. Um, everybody needs to know what the plan is. Mm -hmm. Riken asks, have you ever had a situation where a prescribed fire was used when you felt it wasn't needed or disagreed with some other decision that was decided on? And I guess I would add, you know, what would you do in that sort of situation? Um, I have not had that um, experience. I've only been doing prescribed burns for a couple of years, um, but the the burns that I've been part of um, have been really restorative burns. For example, you can time them to um, reduce uh, non-native, you know, weedy species um, that are taking over your grassland. Um, so I haven't encountered that um, partly because all of these burns are so um, so well planned, and you know what your management objectives are for that piece of land. So you know exactly what the purpose is. Um, but in terms, you know, the, the training that you get to become um, a, a wildland firefighter um, incorporates a lot of emphasis on um, communication. So if you have doubts about something, say an assignment that you're supposed to do that you don't think is safe or you don't think it's the right call, you talk to your supervisor. You talk um, and you communicate. And not only do you communicate, but you make sure your message has been heard um, and they actually understood your intent of that communication. So there's a huge emphasis on communication because lack of communication and, and I'm not a, I don't go to incidents, I'm not a first responder, but um, deaths of first responders um, can happen when, when there's a lack of communication. So that's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sophia asks, what kind of preparations do you have to make before a prescribed fire? Um, a whole plan called a burn plan is prepared. And that gives you, there's modeling that's done on the types of fuels. So the types of vegetation communities on that land, you have defined your objectives. So are you reducing cover for dug firs that are invading in oak woodland? Are you reducing cover for um, plants that will be going to seed and setting more um, seed of weedy species in your grassland? Um, or are you just reducing um, fuel for the next big fire that comes through the area? So you know exactly what your um, objectives are. You know what your burn unit is and your the edges of the burn unit. You do a lot of management of the edges to make sure the edges just are secure and defensible. Um, so um, you might have a crew go in and uh, clean up ladder fuel. So any of, the, any of the branches or shrubs that could take surface fire up into the crowns of trees. There's a lot of, a lot of work um, that happens beforehand. And there's a whole plan with all of your resources that every person has uh, when they arrive and start work on the burn. Well, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. And Stefan asks, how can you get started working in this field? Um, depending on which fields um, you're talking about, um, I would say, you know, in terms of prescribed fire, there are tons of training opportunities coming up um, within the state and within our region where um, we're really working with um, the local junior college, uh, Santa Rosa JC, um, and the Fire Forward program at Audubon Canyon Ranch um, to train up folks so that um, uh, folks like you guys um, can learn about fire ecology, um, restoration ecology, and how to use fire um, as a tool um, to restore our landscapes. Um, in terms of climate 
change and climate adaptation, um, check out your, um, your college um, major options. There are a lot more options now than there were when I was going to college. Um, my university didn't have it as a major at all, um, but I was able to kind of finagle that into my graduate uh, degree. Um, and then volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Uh, there are lots of ways to be part of climate action. You can do advocacy, you can do science, you can do policy, you can look at where policy and science um, intersect. Um, there are a lot of ways to participate um, and just keep exploring, keep exploring and keep opening those doors for yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, well, <clears throat> that wraps up our recorded segment. Thank you again for your time, Anne, and thank you to Christine and Celeste from Sonoma Water for joining us as well.